we now proceed to the sponsored sessions by Abbott and Boston Scientific, and I hand you over to my colleague, Dr. Hung Yu, to take on the Abbott, Scient uh, Abbott sponsored session. Over to you, Dr. Yu. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is KK Yo, and welcome to AICT Asia PCR 2020. This is the official course of the EPSIC conference. Um, I think it is a pleasure to welcome you to today's session sponsored by Abbott Vascular. What matters to patients matters to you. We're going to talk about two hot topics in 2020. The first one, um, which you'll see in the coming slide, is on a very short DAPT is the way to go after drug eluting stent implantation. This talk will be delivered by Professor Takashi Kimura from Kyoto University Hospital from Japan. And with us today, we'll have two uh, illustrious uh, panelists, uh, Dr. Adrian Lo from the National University Hospital in Singapore, and Dr. Kenneth Chin from Pansai Hospital, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Our second hot topic too is uh, patient's safety and comfort. Why vascular closure device should be an option. And this will be delivered uh, by Dr. Sri Chai from um, uh, Thailand, and we're going to have uh, two illustrious uh, panelists again, uh, Dr. Shaiful from IJN uh, Malaysia, um, as well as uh, and, uh, Dr. Sri Chai himself. I will conclude with some uh, brief remarks about uh, these two important hot topics. Now, it gives me um, great pleasure to introduce uh, the panelists we have on today's program. Uh, first, as, you have, as I've alluded to before, we have uh, Professor Takashi Kimura from uh, the Kyoto um, University Hospital in uh, Japan. And uh, Dr. Kimura needs no introduction. He's the head of cardiovascular medicine at Kyoto Hospital. And uh, he has been one of the uh, uh, key investigators in the Stop That 2 trial, uh, which you'll hear more about later on. Our panelists for the first hot topic, uh, Dr. Adrian Lowe is a good friend and a colleague at the National University Hospital Singapore. He needs no in introduction as a very, uh, uh, expert uh, operator and uh, is also the director of the cath lab at the National University Hospital. Um, our panelist, uh, Dr. Kenneth Chin, also needs no introduction. Um, he is the senior consultant international cardiologist at Pantai Hospital, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And he has served as president of the National Heart Association of Malaysia, as well as president of the ASEAN Federation of Cardiology uh, over the past few decades. Um, our a speaker, Dr. Siri Chai, is an interventional cardiologist from uh, Song Lag Nagarin Hospital in uh, Thailand. Um, he has uh, has a deep expertise in vascular closure devices and, and will be sharing his expertise with us in his talk. Uh, Dr. Shaiful is, uh, is known to all of us as well. He's the clinical director of interventional cardiology at uh, Institute uh, Jantung Negara in, uh, in Malaysia. And he has performed uh, ex uh, many procedures in uh, interventional cardiology and will serve uh, as our expert faculty for today's uh, second hot topic. With that uh, introduction, um, I'd like to go to our very first speaker, uh, Professor Kimura, who will talk on the first hot topic. Very short, DAPT is the way to go after drug eluting stand implantation. Over to you, please, uh, Professor Kimura. Okay, uh, Professor Yao, uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's my great pleasure to talk on the uh, very short DAPT uh, after DES implantation. Uh, this is my disclosure. Uh, so in the stopped up two trial, uh, one month uh, dual antiplatelet therapy followed by clopidogrel uh, monotherapy uh, compared with 12 months DAPT was non-inferior uh, for cardiovascular events such as death myocardial infarctions, then thrombosis or stroke. And also uh, spadial uh, for major breathing, TME major uh, minor breathing. Also we uh, published in circulation uh, the stopped up to uh, ALC HBL subgroup analysis. Uh, in this subgroup analysis, the absolute benefit of one month DAPT in reducing uh, TB major minor breathing was greater in patient uh, with HBR, HBR high breathing risk uh, than in those without high breathing risk. Based on these uh, uh, stopped up two trial results, 
JCS Japanese Circulation Society 2020 uh, guideline focused update on anti thrombotic therapy in patients with coronary artery disease recommended uh, one to three months DAPT in patient with a high bleeding risk, but not on oral anticoagulation therapy. And also uh, those patients without high bleeding risk and also uh, without high thrombotic risk patient. Uh, so the prevalence of one month DAPT is clearly increasing in the current Japanese clinical practice. So uh, what are the remaining issues of very short DAPT? I would point out the three uh, aspects. Uh, one is difference in bleeding rates between randomized control trials and daily clinical practice. And the second, a very short DAPT in complex PCI and in SES patients. And finally, a further shortening of DAPT uh, clinically relevant. So if we uh, compare the uh, measure uh, breathing rate uh, in the stopped up two, which is a randomized control trial, and the Credo Kyoto uh, registry cohort three, a real world clinical registry. The rate of major bleeding uh, in the stop that two is 2.7% in patients with HBR and 12 months DAPT. In contrast, uh, in the Credo Kyoto cohort three, uh, major bleeding at one year uh, in HBR patient is 14%. So the rate of major bleeding is much higher in the real clinical practice than in RCT. Uh, therefore, the absolute benefit of very short DAPT is greater in the real clinical practice than in RCT. So the, uh, the answer to the first question uh, is that the uh, breathing rate is much higher in daily clinical practice than in RCT. Therefore, the effort to reduce breathing is particularly relevant in daily clinical practice. So second question is a very short DAPT in complex PCI and in ACS patients. So uh, we uh, compare the, uh, those patients who underwent complex PCI versus non-complex PCI in the Credo Kyoto Registry cohort two. Uh, using the uh, uh, complex PCI criteria proposed by the European Society of Cardiology. Uh, we had 35% uh, uh, of patients with complex, who underwent complex PCI and 65% of patients who underwent non-complex PCI. If we look at the uh, uh, cumulative incidence of uh, thrombotic events and also breathing events, uh, MI ischemic stroke risk is uh, clearly uh, higher in patients who underwent complex PCI than in patients without complex PCI uh, during the first 30 days uh, after uh, PCI. However, beyond 30 days after PCI, uh, the risk for uh, thrombotic uh, events is virtually uh, no difference, very com comparable. So thrombotic risk beyond one month after complex PCI was comparable to that after non-complex PCI. So one month DAPT might be uh, reasonable in patients who underwent complex PCI. Also, uh, we undertook the uh, subgroup analysis for complex PCI in the stop the two trial. Uh, if we look at the TME major minor breathing, uh, the benefit of reducing, preventing uh, breathing uh, might be greater uh, in patients with complex PCI than in uh, those with non-complex PCI. But this is still the uh, uh, 500 patient subgroup analysis. Uh, so it is a uh, very preliminary data. So SES patients have traditionally been regarded as high risk for ischemic event based on the uh, mortality endpoints. Indeed, in this analysis, uh, cardiovascular death, uh, death rate was significantly higher in patients with ACS uh, than, in stable, in, than those uh, with stable CAD. 
However, the excess risk of ACS patients uh, for cardiovascular death was uh, limited to the initial 90 day, indicating that the, uh, those deaths uh, uh, clearly related to the index ACS event, uh, but not uh, related to the uh, thrombotic event after uh, ACS event. The uh, uh, mortality, cardiovascular mortality risk is basically very comparable uh, between those patients with ACS and stable CAD. So we looked at the uh, uh, cumulative incidence of myocardial infarction and ischemic stroke. So thrombotic risk besides the uh, mortality outcome. So ACS patients compared with non-ACS patients had only marginally a higher risk for MI or ischemic stroke. Now we are <coughs> conducting stop tap to uh, ACS trial enrolling only uh, ACS patients and compared uh, one month DAPT uh, versus 12 months DAPT. Uh, we have just finished enrollment of the stop up two uh, ACS in June this year uh, during the uh, uh, pandemic of uh, COVID-19. So the uh, uh, answer to the second question, a uh, very short DAPT in complex PCI and in ACS patients, uh, yes, it might also have benefit in complex PCI and ACS patients. We should wait for results from the stop up two ACS and uh, stop up two total cohort. So the final question is further shortening of DAPT uh, is clinically relevant. So if we look at the uh, previous analysis of the uh, credit field cohort three ACS HBL analysis, uh, we should notice uh, that the 30 day uh, breathing, is re breathing rate is uh, very high. But uh, uh, if we look at the uh, timing of breathing in the credit field cohort three, uh, the breathing event is uh, uh, clustering within uh, three days after PCI. Uh, so stopping up aspirin at time of hospital discharge uh, may not be relevant uh, to prevent uh, breathing early after PCI. So now we are starting stopped up three trial uh, exploring completely aspirin free strategy based on the observations that the very high breathing risk of uh, ACS patients or ALCHBL patients acutely uh, we enroll only ALC HBR patients or uh, ACS patients. So randomization uh, will be performed before PCI, not at time of hospital discharge. Uh, we are going to enroll uh, 3,000 patients and uh, randomly assign those patients to either a no aspirin group, completely aspirin free uh, strategy, or one month uh, durant a platelet therapy group. As a, a P2Y12 receptor broker, uh, we exclusively use uh, Prasugrel, monos, uh, Prasugrel uh, for uh, Japanese dose, not a global dose. The primary endpoint of breathing and uh, cardiovascular events will be assessed at uh, Saturday. So uh, the answer for the uh, final question, further shortening of DAPT is clinically relevant. Uh, yes, it's clinically very relevant uh, considering the very high breathing rates early after PCI in SES and HBL patients. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thanks, uh, Professor Kimura, for the uh, wonderful talk. Um, I think with that uh, background in mind, it's probably good to, to have our two panelists uh, give their thoughts on some of the of this hot topic of a short uh, DAPT in dry looting stairs. So maybe I'll just start off with a quick question to both of you, uh, uh, Kenneth and Adrian. Um, you know, given the, the, the various trials that have come out in the past uh, couple of years on the short DAPT duration, um, in dry looting stands. Can I find out from your own practice in what proportion of patients um, after receiving a dry looting stand would benefit from a short DAPT? Maybe Kenneth first? Uh, 
in subset of patients with high bleeding risks, uh, we would consider bringing down, at least in my practice, to one month uh, for very senior patients on NOAC and uh, subsequently uh, go on uh, uh, monotherapy. But with mon NOAC, uh, now I've changed on to NOAC plus clopidogrel and then maintain it for uh, three months and subsequently maintain a NOAC alone. But in other patients with the high risk uh, with other comorbidities like renal failure, diabetes, uh, low ejection fraction, uh, my general practice has been with uh, three months initially and if the patient can tolerate it and thereafter change on to a monotherapy with um, um, until recently we've been using prasugrel because patient compliance is much better once a day and the side effects are, are very minimal. And I've been tailoring the dose down to the Japanese dose of five milligram a day because we're Asians and the Japanese have shown with five milligram, they can maintain anti platelet activity quite sufficiently. What about you, Adrian? What do you think? Yeah, I, I, I would say that uh, I'm generally not as uh, aggressive as I can have when it comes to such a short uh, antiplatelet uh, duration. Uh, most of my patients actually do have acute coronary syndrome. And most of them, to, unless there are strong reasons uh, to have a shorter DAPT, we still go with... Uh, six months to a year. Well, certainly if the patient has uh, comorbids that uh, would require a shorter duration of the APT, for example, to early surgery, then to, uh, we would actually try and uh, taper them off after a month or three months, yeah, depending on the clinical situation. And I think this, uh, Duration of DAPT is a very uh, individualized one that has to be adjusted to the patient's profile. Because on the one hand, I know there is a fashion now to try and reduce the duration of DAPT. We do also know that uh, the longer DAPT may have some benefit in patients with uh, large uh, arterial burden. So to, um, depending on the patient's uh, clinical profile, I don't uh, routinely put them to, uh, on a short uh, DAPT duration. Although I would say that uh, the lecture by uh, Dr. Kimura was uh, fascinating and he's suggesting that uh, we really should be using a shorter DAPT duration for uh, much broader range of patients than we do now, actually. Yeah, well, thanks uh, both uh, uh, Kenneth and Adrian for your sharing your thoughts. I, in my practice, um, I mean, I generally would still stick to one year, especially as you as you say, a lot of our patients have acute coronary syndromes. Um, certainly, if uh, if they have high bleeding risk profile, whether it is uh, age or low hemoglobin or you know some something else that has uh, that fits uh, the criteria for a high bleeding risk patient. I think in general, uh, we still prefer, you know, just perhaps out of uh, paranoia, we still to keep longer. But it is reassuring to have the the, the Zions family of uh, stands have the Zions 28 and the Zions 90 trial data, as well as the stop that trial data to suggest that a shorter duration DAPT is safe if needed, especially if it is an elective patient. Now, I would, I would, Maybe just ask one question. Uh, are there anatomical subsets that even if the trial data says that, you know, it's safe, you wouldn't be so keen to keep on uh, one month or even three month DAPT? Maybe Adrian, yeah. you could um, have. Yeah. So to, uh, personally, I think if it's, the patient has had a, a complex left main uh, bifurcation stenting, especially say with uh, use of two stents, I would really be very hesitant to, to just jump on the bandwagon of just one month DAPT. I would really still try and push for a longer duration of DAPT. Maybe 
up to a year even. If the patient has a large blood burden and also has a history of recurrent acute coronary syndromes. Yeah, I fully agree with what you, about Adrian. The left main is one subset that we do not have large data. Uh, last year at TCT, um, our, our, our colleague from Netherlands uh, presented the ideal left main, where he compared uh, one stand with uh, with uh, three months D, four months DEPT versus another one, uh, which was the science versus uh, uh, the synergy stand, uh, with another lot of uh, DEPT. The comparison was uh, uh, not well received, and uh, therefore uh, we do not have strong data yet. I think uh, until we have strong data, uh, I, we will be very uncomfortable to 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 reduce the DAPT even in the subsets of high bleeding risk patients. Unless they bleed, then we have to uh, perhaps take off the aspirin. I think that's mm. that's the other interesting point. Uh, beyond uh, the period of DAPT, which one? Would you uh, stop? Would you stop the the P two Y twelve inhibitor and continue with aspirin, or would you stop the aspirin and continue with the P two Y twelve inhibitor? In my practice, until recently, I've been using prosugrel as a monotherapy, five milligram, because with prosugrel, I'm very comfortable that patients will convert to the active form, not like uh, not like Plavix. Uh, well, with the uh, with the ticker galore, it's twice a day, and my patients generally are not so comfortable. And you got a lot of side effects of shortness of breath in about maybe more than ten percent of my patients, and some do have bradycardia. So, again, twice a day is not a very comfortable dose on long term. So, quite a lot of my patients until recently are on prasugrel five milligram. And some of them still still to get them from Taiwan and Japan. It's not available in Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, and even in Australia. So they go and buy through some doctors there and bring them back. Wow, that's that's uh, <laughs> you know I I do find it sometimes challenging with some of the more recent data regarding you know a more aggressive antiplatelet therapy in in other subsets of patients um such as the uh, the ticagrelor 60 mg twice a day and the uh the the prosugrel uh dosing um sorry the 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 doeg uh, dosing so i i must say that uh, in the setting of stents it is at least none, nonetheless reassuring that uh for patients who do have high bleeding risk um, the uh, the uh, these uh, new stand platforms such as the Zines platform allows for one DAPT, but but I agree with both of you that we really have to be pushed uh, by the high bleeding risk to to maybe um, use this um, uh, this particular strategy. So, um, may, do you have any uh, last comments from anyone, uh, Doctor Yeo? We still need more data on the AMI setting. Uh, where the the current data on short DAPT with twilight and tickle uh, only focus about 10 to 20 percent of patients with STEMI. So a more rigorous uh, trial focus on STEMI with short DAPT uh, should be conducted. We have previous trial at Triton, uh, Plato and Pegasus that show that we should have longer DAPT. So this is a controversial issue and need to be addressed uh, in randomized trials. Well, thanks very much, Dr. Chin, for that very nice summary on the on you know what we still need to know with regards to short DAPT, especially in AMI patients. I think what we have heard from our speaker, Dr. Kimura, and our panelists, uh, Dr. Lo and Dr. Chin, is a very nice overview of um, the role of uh, short DAPT um, in the patients who receive a dry looting stance. But clearly, while it is uh, safe in patients with high bleeding risk, there are still areas where evidence is lacking. And we'll, with that, I think we can conclude this hot topic. I'll now like on to move on to hot topic number two. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, okay. Well, so my talk is the patient safety and comfort. Why vascular culture device should be an option. Okay. Um, I don't have any uh, conflict of interest. So as you as you know, uh, the 
now we are performing core angiogram and angioplasty from the wrist. And uh, because of the clinical benefits and early discharge, cost saving, and patient satisfaction. But the transfemoral approach is still viable, especially in case of difficult anatomy, unable to access radio, instead without disease, emergency, mechanical support device, and structural intervention. And uh, there's still some uh, local complications associated with femoral artery access, uh, mostly uh, hematoma and uh, to do an fistula, uh, vessel laceration, dissection, and uh, some of uh, vestial culture, retinotinium hemorrhage, and uh, neural damage infection, as you can see on the slide. And there are two uh, methods of uh, femoral artery closure. The first one is manual compression, but it's, uh, it's uh, associated with, with uh, pain, and uh, we need the medical staff uh, to see uh, the patient, and uh, the patient has to keep on the bed for four to six hours. And uh, there's so there's a uh, muscular culture device, active and passive device that may be attractive for this uh, this uh, artery closure. And the passive muscular closure device uh, is uh, basically is a device to enhance homeostasis and uh, promote the 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 the, the uh, the closure, but do not achieve some hemostasis and short, or shortening the time to ambulation. And the idea was glass closure device should have our obvious. And uh, I would like to point out that the most uh, important one is uh, to achieve the secure the hemostasis and allow the access for the least and close site. There are uh, many uh, devices available in the market. And uh, there are the Zealand bears future based and clip based system. And uh, as you can see on the slides, angular seals, as you know, is uh, a vascular plaque system by always on anchor and collagen plaque. And uh, sometimes it's uh, associated with vascular occlusion and some infection. And uh, there's a vessel seal duet that has you know, longer marketed. And here is a start close device. It's a nitty now clip device, uh, ex extra vascular mechanical device to get together and promote healing. Okay, and uh, here is, uh, I think it's the uh, most widely used uh, nowadays is a suture mediated device uh, for close focus system. Basically, it's create a uh, suture loop and uh, we can use as a large ball closure. And as you can see, uh, it's uh, come with the pre tie and monofilament. Uh, mount on the needle, and, uh, and it's the beauty of this is this can create a uh, approximation and very uh, promote uh, healing like a suture uh, directly. I just want to skip this one like animation. Uh, here, I think that this uh, particular device is the only vascular closure system with the broadest indication for artery and vascular venous closure. We can close the artery from 5 French to 21 French, and we can close the vein from 5 to 24 French. But uh, if, for, if we want to close the artery uh, more than 8 French, we have to use it uh, three closes and two devices. And uh, when we use two devices, we have to use it uh, in this configuration, uh, around 60 degrees to, uh, to 90 degrees. Uh, and like a cross map uh, configuration. And uh, here is the list of the artery vascular culture device that, I, that you can see on the slides, but there's a uh, limited data about this device. So here's a summarization for the, uh, for the uh, vascular culture device. And I just want to point out the, some, some important things. The first one is uh, nothing in terminal. As you can see, the collagen based device is worse because when it uh, has the uh, anchor plate stay inside the vascular, the artery. And uh, the lead access, uh, actually, the collagen based device is, has some limitation, but actually, you can, you can re access the, the closed side by puncture above or below a centimeter, but uh, you cannot uh, have the same, exactly the same spot. But uh, different from the, the, the collagen base, the suture base, you can have immediate free access. And uh, you can uh, 
list the why in place uh, for use another uh, uh, secure device. And this is a picture show you how important is the anchor the anchor device in the inside the lumen. Sometimes can cause the luminal area obstruction. And uh, yeah, the was line or ultrasound uh, study from the Korean. And as you can see, uh, uh, at six months, NGO still still have some uh, collagen plaques above the artery, as you can see on the slide. Uh, uh, we cannot see that on the focal system. So uh, what is the evidence of the vascular closure device? So uh, uh, here is a uh, meta-analysis uh, concerning vascular closure device that is from the older study and it uh, has uh, a lot of uh, VGC data and their carriers, a lot of confounding. The most important one is the uh, skills uh, of the vascular culture device operators, is especially for the future based system. Uh, you, have to, you have to do more than 300 to achieve the, 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 the good uh, culture. And vascular culture failure is not the same is the complication as you can see on the slides. Uh, the collagen plaque based system can have a bad, the best uh, vascular closure success, but when we uh, look at the complication, it's a different story. Uh, and here's the recent data analysis. So, for me, the long story short is um, there's no different in vascular complication. And, and the, the most important is shorten the time to ambulation. And here's network meta analysis compared to vascular torture device. As you can see, they are all the same with the manual com, com, of compression and no excess uh, vascular complication. And if you look at the uh, study uh, after uh, the trial after 2005, you can see this uh, is quite small, but uh, I just show you uh, uh, that's uh, associated with better outcome compared to the manual compression. And there are some uh, data, small data, suggest that uh, breathing complications can reduce this vascular closure device in very high risk patients. Uh, sometimes we can have uh, better, uh, better uh, in terms of complications. And I think this is the largest uh, registry, US registry, uh, that has uh, a million uh, closure devices uh, used. And as you can see, it's quite small, but uh, it's uh, concluded that the use of vascular culture device was associated with a 0.4% absolute risk reduction in vascular access complications. And number needed to treat is 250. So it means that it's safe. It's safe, but the number it needs to treat is quite high. And when we are looking at the ambulation study, uh, uh, this is uh, from the per close for guide system. As you can see, uh, this study uh, study uh, are in a small number, but it's very good. Uh, this study showed that uh, we can we, we can have the patient ambulate at 20 minutes, less than 30 minutes uh, compared to the manual compression. So it's, it's safe. And, uh, and the cost effective from this study is, uh, is very good. Uh, it can cut the cost of the nurse extent and the cat lab holding. And uh, here is the list of the key factors for success of the last culture device, adaptation, physician, and device specifics. So in conclusion, the use of femoral culture device after complete angiography or PCI have to propose uh, the first one is the improvement of the patient comfort and the reduction of the complication list. The transhumal approach is increasingly challenged by the transradial rush, and which is safer and has been associated with decreased mortality in specific subgroups. But in the term of the tower, the use of mechanical support device have influenced to interventional pathologies to mastering the transhumal approach and vascular approach device. I think the quality of the femoral puncture is still essential. And the combination of good puncture and vascular closure device like per close device, we can achieve a high success rate like translabial. And patient can be discharged three hours after the procedure with an extremely low rate of local complication. So what vascular closure device should be considered for our transhumanal puncture, especially in PCI, in 
the wind channel cardiologist day to day work. So that's all my conclusion. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sirichai, for a very nice overview of the use of vascular closure devices uh, in interventional cardiology. So I think you gave a very nice overview of what are the key points, both uh, safety and comfort being key among them. So I, I maybe I'll just start off with some questions. Um, Shaiful, uh, in, in your practice, um, do you use uh, vascular closure devices uh, for the femoral access uh, as a matter of routine? Thank you, KK. Yes, indeed, uh, if there is any uh, concern, especially with uh, patients of uh, uh, easy bleeding, patient on anticoagulation, for instance, patients with uh, end-stage renal failure, where you know that the clots are not going to be really stable, patient with uh, uncontrolled hypertension, and as Dr. Sirichai mentioned earlier, patient who require early ambulation, and discharge, yes, I would consider a, I mean, a closure device. Mm. And and um, just uh, maybe just to push on a little bit, uh, I can see from Dr. Shirichai's talk that uh, he's a proponent of the um, you know the per close device. What is the what 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 is your uh, how do you call it standard device used in uh, in in your institution? Uh, for yes, our Dr. Um, yeah, I have both the uh, angioseal and the uh, proglide. And uh, of course, uh, I can choose between that. The only thing will be the lesion. Sometimes if you really want uh, stability and if you have a patient with a calcified uh, region, I would consider uh, 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 seal with a active uh, fixation within the lumen. But if the vessel looks okay and uh, I'm happy with the uh, suture, I will use a proglide. Yeah, that's that's my practice also. Um, I, I maybe then I'll just ask um, Doctor Sri Chai for his comments and thoughts. You know, we have one interesting slide that talked about the number of uh, cases you need to do before you become sufficiently experienced, especially with a device like the proglide. Um, do you think in, in Asia, you know, what, what kind of numbers do we need? And do we really need 200 cases? It's quite a lot. <laughs> exactly. But uh, I, I don't know exactly the number, but there may be, uh, in my mind, maybe a uh, hundred is, is okay. I think if there, with there, with there, with there, this uh, new device, uh, because, you know, because first course for guy has been developed for a few for a few years, and uh, this uh, now I think it's very very easy to use and very user friendly. But yes, yes, I still need to to learn and uh, and uh, a few kids need. But I think two hundred fifty is too much. <laughs> yeah, I mean I I think it's uh, you know when I when I when I uh, work through with this with my fellows and uh, uh, trainees, um, it's quite clear that there are quite a lot of steps and. It takes a while for people to get a hang of it, but perhaps more importantly is uh, what to do if there's a problem, you know, the troubleshooting or the uh, complications. Um, and in that, I have a question for both of you. Um, um, do you uh, routinely give antibiotics for uh, for your patients who get a vascular closure device, whether it's, uh, you know, per close or angel seal or star close? Do you all routinely give antibiotics? Uh Okay, me, me first. Uh, I'm systematically use the antibiotics, and uh, because of I'm afraid of the infection, because I experienced the one case, one or two cases with the infection and need to convert to surgical treatment, and uh, I and I usually close the hole with the sterilized strip. And that's uh, that's um, that's my practice. Oh, on my part, we don't use antibiotic routinely. But when we implant devices like TAVI or IOTIC devices like EVA and TIVA, our anesthesiology clique will do it uh, routinely with the uh, antibiotic, and I guess we are covered in that way. Yeah, yeah in, my, in my practice uh, for the large ball devices, I do use antibiotics, and oftentimes you know, given by the anesthesiologist. Um, but if it is uh, you know, a coronary angiogram, uh, I sometimes don't, but most times because if they are diabetic or 
have end stage renal failure or they are a bit obese and I'm worried about, um, you know, uh, how do I call it, uh, uh, fat folds, then I would, I would give uh, antibiotics. But, you know, it is, I think our biggest fear is a complication uh, arising with, from infection, just like what Dr. Siri Chai mentioned. You know, the other thing which I am always very curious about is uh, this theory about repuncturing within, um, you know, a two-month period for the angiocele. I know that the perclose is safe to repuncture. And have you had any problems with repuncturing uh, either device? You know, whether it is the perclose or the angiocele? Maybe, uh, Shaifu, maybe we'll go to you this time first. Okay. Uh, as per the uh, per close, I wouldn't mind, you know, e even uh, puncturing immediately after the uh, suture because we understand that the hole will be very small and even if you punch at the same hole, very unlikely that you're going to hit the uh, suture and cause problem there. But if there is a device like uh, angio seal, if I were to punch you on the same point, I would always go higher or lower from the initial puncture site. That's the reason why we take pictures of the groin all the time before we come out from the procedure. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sri Chai? Yeah, I do the same. I do the same. Okay. Um, then uh, what about uh, uh, venous access? Do you use the, I mean, do you have experience using the, the per close for venous access? Uh, yeah, either one of you? Yes. Uh, okay. I, I have to, I have tried uh, a few cases for the venous access for uh, for the metal clip cases, but there's a uh, a few cases, but uh, but every case that I use is is uh, can achieve the uh, hemostasis immediately, and uh, can can have the patient uh, early ambulation without any any complication, but just a few cases. Uh, on my side, I do not intervene the venous as much, but I do assist my EP colleagues who does the uh, implantable pacemaker in the RV. Yes, uh, we use ProGlide for that closure, but definitely uh, one closure device will be enough for even a bigger hole. Hmm. So this next question is a bit tricky. So I, I mean, my personal philosophy is that it's probably good to learn to use at least two devices. Um, and um, of course, one of them is the perclose because of the advantages that uh, Dr. Sirichai mentioned, you know, the ability to reaccess immediately and also the ability to leave a wire in. And the third advantage, of course, being that you can put in large bore uh, devices for both artery and vein. So those are huge advantages that any, I think, structural interventionist needs to know. What is your second favorite device after the perclose? For, for for both of you, maybe uh, Sri Chai first. Yeah, uh, yes, I have uh, experience about the uh, the uh, the failure of the first clause in the Tawi cases. But uh, when I, I experienced that, I used the uh, angio view to, to close the hole. Uh, like uh, I failed, I, I used two first clause and still uh, fail. And so I just used the third one is the angio view. Yeah, yeah, I agree that uh, I think we need to 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 have at least two systems in, in on the shelf, and um, sometimes we can we can we cannot use uh, just only one. Shaiful, I, I mean on, on my side, side, you also have two. Yes, we have two, KK, okay, okay. but uh, maybe maybe uh, you know I can share a bit here. If you're comfortable enough with the uh, ProGlide, per, uh, per close ProGlide, you can actually do a few things uh, with the sutures and being, you know, close to the surgeons. What we can do is uh, we can use the, the thread to push in uh, some pleating, you know, put it on the little hole and put them on the suture of the ProGlide and push it down into the hole if they're still leaking so those are the funny, funny tricks that you learn when you go ahead and do cases with the surgeons. But uh, we need another you know, forum to discuss this. Well, thank you very much, uh, both uh, Dr. Uh, Siri Chai and Dr. Shai Fu, and uh, for your sharing your experience and uh, for a very nice talk, uh, Dr. Siri Chai. So I think we have come to the end of hot topic number two, uh, which is on 
um, uh, patient's safety and comfort, uh, why vascular closure devices should be an option. So um, it now leaves me great pleasure to close uh, this session uh, with um, uh, sponsored by uh, Abbott Vascular. Um, and you have heard two important hot topics. The first being a very short DAPT is the way to go after drug eluting stand implantation. And the second, which we just heard, is on um, uh, patients' safety and comfort, why vascular closure devices should be an option in, uh, the, in the world of interventional cardiology. You would agree with me that uh, all uh, our speakers and panelists uh, provided great insights and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, knowledge in terms of these two topics. And I'd like to thank them uh, for their great contributions, as well as uh, AICT Asia PCR for hosting today's program and Abbott for kindly uh, supporting this important educational initiative. Thank you and good night.